Okay, so I think we'll uh, start. So it is a great pleasure to um, introduce Professor Franz Forschnerich from University of Ljubljana, who will speak on new complex analytic methods in the theory of minimal surfaces, or perhaps there is a new title. Thank you very much. I thank you for the, especially Claudio Arezzo for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be back at ICTP. I had one very pleasant experience here um, three years ago for two weeks. We had a program, a conference, and a PhD school. Okay, so today, uh, this is on, right? It's okay. So today I'll give a rather uh, easy and uh, non-technical talk about a subject that was uh, new to me in uh, 2011 when I first met uh, these two people from Granada, Spain, Antonio Larcon and uh, Francisco Lopez, and then we became collaborators. And whatever I know about Riemann surfaces, I mean, I mean about minimal surfaces is basically they, they taught me and uh, maybe I taught them some complex analysis. We discovered that putting these two things together was extremely fruitful. So the talk is, as I say, it's going to be very non-technical kind of survey. Uh, the first uh, 10 or 12 slides are kind of promotional. If you've never seen the stuff before, then it's uh, okay. If you have seen it, then please just skip this part. Um, and then later I'll tell you about some new things which we did together using complex analytic methods. Uh, so first, uh, uh, the subject of uh, minimal surfaces is uh, quite old. So in fact, the first time when the uh, notion of minimal surface was mentioned was by Euler in this uh, year 1744. And this was on a kind of intuitive level. He thought of, uh, just as we think today, that a minimal surface is a surface with a property that if you take some domain with boundary inside such a surface, so the surface is sitting in some Euclidean space, maybe R3, maybe higher, and you take a small piece of it, and then you vary it in a normal direction, you perturb it, and if the area uh, can only increase but cannot decrease, then you call it a minimal surface. And so Euler, uh, in fact, gave an argument that the only area minimizing surfaces of rotation, meaning you take a curve and you rotate it and you get surface, then these are planes and catenoids. And here is a picture of a catenoid. Uh, then it was, uh, this topic was picked up by Lagrange, who did first analytical work on the subject, and he actually came up with this equation. So this is an equation uh, for a function. You look at a graph of a function over a domain, and you'd like to know um, when is it a critical point of the area functional? And this precisely means that if you take a one parameter family of perturbations and you keep the boundary fixed, you look at the area each time, so you find area as a function of t, then you differentiate at time zero and you ask that it be zero. This was uh, uh, the first time when variational approach was used. So Lagrange came up with this equation, which has to be satisfied uh, which, which characterizes the stationary points of the area functional. Well, this equation, if you look at it, it's really, um, it looks like Laplace, right? But in fact, it is, uh, it is the metric Laplacian, in fact. We'll come to it later. And then, um, this year, a few years later, uh, showed that he was the first one who made the connection with this main point, namely that the mean curvature function has to vanish identically. So, uh, so we say today that a smoothly immersed surface in R3 is a minimal surface if its mean curvature function is identically zero. So what is the mean curvature? It's simply at each point you have, a, at each point of a surface, you have two um, principal curvatures, which means you look at the curvature of the curves going through that point in different tangent directions, and there are two special directions. One is along which the minimum will happen, and one is along which the maximum will happen. They are orthogonal to each other, and those are principal curvatures. Then you take their average, and that's called the principal curvature. The product is, of course, called the Gaussian curvature. Um, so the, the connection is that 
Yes, so the surface is a minimal surface, even if and only if its mean curvature function is zero. If you look at surfaces in higher dimension, it's still a little bit like this, except that then uh, you have more normal vectors, not just one. If the surface is in R3, you have only one unit normal vector, or actually two. You can take, depending on the orientation, but if you're in dimension four or higher, then you have n minus two independent normal vectors, fields, and you have to actually choose one. One of them, you fix it, and then you can calculate again these quantities, the principal curvature, principal curvatures, the mean and the, no, and the Gaussian curvature with respect to that normal direction. But the theorem is still the same, that all these curvatures, mean curvatures have to vanish in order that the surface is a minimal surface. Um, here is another picture of a minimal surface. This is called a helicoid. So you see, it's uh, essentially what you do is you take a line in the plane and you rotate it, but then at the same time you lift it at a constant speed. So it's just the screw, Archimedes screw, um, helicoid. And that's another minimal surface. And then it was proved by Catalan in 1842 that the helicoid and the plane are the only ruled minimal surfaces. Ruled means they're actually unions of straight lines. Um, Plateau made a, uh, introduced a new topic in the theory because he started looking at the question when you take a curve in space, a closed curve image of the circle, uh, can you find a minimal surface in such a way that this curve is its boundary? This became known as Plateau problem. And in fact, this Plateau problem was solved in 1932 independently by Douglas and Radeau, and they showed that the answer is yes, that every continuous Jordan curve spans a minimal surface. This minimal surface might have some singularities. It's not immersed in general, but still. Um, uh, then Riemann uh, also made a contribution to this topic. He discovered some interesting family of examples. Here is a picture. So this example is supposed to suggest, these are called uh, Riemann's minimal examples. So they suggest properly embedded minimal surfaces which have countably many parallel planar ends, you see them here. End is uh, what goes to infinity, right? So there are countably many parallel to each other. Um, and every horizontal plane intersects each of them in either a circle or a strained plane. Topologically, they are actually just plane domains. Now, uh, let's uh, now do some mathematics. Um, if you assume that M is an open Riemann surface, how do Riemann surfaces come in? Riemann surfaces come in as follows. If you have a surface in Euclidean space, embedded or immersed, then what you can do is put uh, the Euclidean metric, you pull it back, you restrict it to the surface. So you have a metric on the surface. Now let's say that the surface is also orientable. Uh, we, we know that metric, well, it determines conformal structure, and that also determines the complex structure together with orientation. It determines the, because you have a unique, um, for each vector, you have a unique orthogonal vector of the same length, and so you determine the J operator, and that gives you um, complex structure. So it's very natural to look at these things, at least if they are orientable, as um, Riemann surfaces. And, um, and if you do this, if you take this metric, which I told you, that you just pull back the Euclidean metric to the surface, then actually by the very definition, uh, your embedding or immersion becomes conformal from this structure which you defined on the surface by this metric to the Euclidean space. It's a conformal. So it's natural to look at conformal maps. And then it turns out that um, if you look at the smooth immersion from a Riemann surface to Rn, uh, okay, we define it to be conformal if it preserves angles, the usual definition. Now, if we denote by H its mean curvature vector, I told you before, what is the mean curvature if you have a surface in R3? In that case, you, this is a scalar function, but you multiply it with a normal direction, so you get a vector field, okay? In higher dimensions, you have a, also a vector field, to, uh, which, is, which is called mean curvature vector field. And in fact, here is the crucial relationship that the Laplacian of your map is simply twice the mean curvature. Here, this Laplacian has to be the metric Laplacian. 
So it's, it's this metric. You take the Euclidean metric, pull it back, call it G. But you see, um, this simplifies actually this formula because usually you like to work in what's called an isothermal coordinate. There is a classical theorem going back to Gauss that each time you have a metric on a surface, the simplest coordinates you can choose so the metric becomes as simple as possible, are called isothermal coordinates, and they are coordinates in which the metric is simply a multiple, this is a function of the Euclidean metric, okay? And if this, uh, if this is the case, then it turns out that the metric Laplacian is related just by this factor. This is a positive factor, of course, uh, with the usual Laplacian. So it doesn't matter which, really, which Laplacian you use, Either you use this factor or you don't, but here basically you have this formula. So the main conclusion that we now have is that if you look at a conformal immersion, then it's minimal if and only if it's harmonic, because H, minimal means H is zero, and harmonic means this function, Laplace is zero. And again, it doesn't matter if you use metric Laplacian or the standard complex Laplacian, because it's only the scalar factor in between. Good. Um, now, what is the connection with complex analysis? Of course, as soon as you talk about harmonic functions or harmonic maps, it's somehow clear that complex analysis is involved. Okay, but it can be made a bit more systematic. So if uh, X is a smooth function of a complex variable, now I'll call it theta, which, in fact, I think of this theta as some local coordinate on a Riemann surface, okay? Uh, then we have these two derivatives, this delta of x, uh, which is written like that. This is the one zero part of the external derivative. So this is the C linear part. And then you have the d bar of x, which is the zero one part, the antilinear. And in fact, holomorphic functions are characterized by this equation, the d bar, so the second derivative is zero. This is the standard Cauchy-Riemann equations. And that's equivalent to saying that the exterior differential is just del. Uh, then x is harmonic if Laplacian of x, which is really the same thing as uh, this operator, 2i d d bar, is zero. This is just a little calculation. And so this means that another equivalent condition is that del of x is holomorphic because del of x is a one zero form. And here you see that del bar of it has to be zero. This is just equivalent to saying that this is holomorphic. So upshot, the two things together, is that if you look at an immersion, uh, no, that's not an upshot. This is a discussion about holomorphic and harmonic. But then there is a separate point, namely, that an immersion from a Riemann surface to R, to Rn, is conformal, meaning angle preserving, if and only if this is true. If you take partial derivatives of x on u and on v, u and v are the real and the imaginary part of the local coordinate, and uh, conformality means that these two partial derivatives, which are vectors, are orthogonal to each other, and they have the same length. That's, that, that's clear. This is just conformality going from u plus iv to the Euclidean space. Uh, but now the good point is that we can rewrite this condition as follows. That we take this uh, delta of the components of x, so this derivative, the holomorphic derivative, and we square them and we sum them up and we get zero. And this is very easy to see because if you look, what happens when you remember that x is a real map. So x is real, so this is the real part this is the imaginary part. What happens when you square it? You get, a, you get dot, uh, these, these are vectors. So what you get is a dot product of this vector with itself. So you get this quantity, x on u square. And then you get, um, if you look at the real part of these squares, you also get x on v modulus square with a minus sign now because you have this uh, i here. So what you get as the real part of this uh, quantity, you get precisely the difference of this length, length of the x on u square minus x on v square. This becomes the real part of this expression. And the imaginary part really becomes this expression because the imaginary part is you multiply this vector with that vector and uh, once more the other way around. So you really get just 
this. So you can encode these two e real equations into this complex equation. Okay, and that, that is crucial because now, now, um, so now the upshot is that the smooth immersion from my Riemann surface to Rn is a conformal and minimal both at the same time, which means conformal minimal surface, if and only if the following things are true. First of all, del of x, so the one zero derivative, this vector, this is a vector valued one form, is holomorphic, and the sum of the squares of the components are zero, okay? So this is an analytic characterization of what is a minimal surface. Now, I can fix, a, maybe I don't like to work with forums. Instead of working with one forums, it's easier to work with functions. So what I do, I, I can fix a nowhere vanishing holomorphic one forum on M, and you see such always exists because M has to be an open Riemann surface. M cannot be compact by a maximum principle. You cannot put it a, a compact thing inside Rn uh, by a, <coughs> such a map. So, uh, and if M is an open Riemann surface, then it's a very classical theorem going back to um, 67. It's the so-called gunninger simkan theorem, which says that, in fact, you have such a forum. Actually, Gunninger and Simkan tell you more. Uh, they tell you that every open Riemann surface admits a holomorphic function which has no critical points. So this holomorphic function gives you an immersion of your Riemann surface to C. And then you can simply take the differential of this function for this forum. So you even get an exact forum that has no zeros. And if you use any such forum, um, uh, then uh, you can actually divide. You see, if you divide del x by such a forum, uh, then in fact you get a map into this, uh, into this quadric variety. So you define, this is called a null quadric for some reason. Uh, this is the quadric of all vectors in Cn where the sum of the squares of zero. So following this equation. Uh, and then the upshot is that how do we represent conformal minimal immersions? Everyone is of this forum. So you start with some map F, holomorphic map from your Riemann surface to this null quadric, except I take away zero. To take away zero basically means that I will look at immersions only. If you allow value zero, then you allow branch points. But I want to speak about immersions. So you go to punctured null quadric, this, this gadget without zero. Take a holomorphic map, you multiply it with this one forum. So we have f theta, this is now a candidate for this del x. But what is the condition that you can integrate it? Well, the condition is this one, that the integral of, this, uh, of the real part of this one forum has to be zero over all closed curves. Otherwise, the integral is not well defined. And if you indeed know that your uh, thing comes as a differential, then of course this is satisfied. Differential, when you integrate it on closed curves, it's zero. Okay, so this is called the Weierstrass formula. And this Weierstrass formula, which tells you everybody you're interested in, all your objects are of this forum. So they are essentially integrals of um, products of a map, holomorphic map from M to the null quadric with your fixed one forum. Their condition that you can integrate is that, that the integrals over closed curves, we call these periods, real periods, they have to be zero. Then you can integrate and you get a conformal minimal immersion because it's derivative del of this is actually this, this thing underneath, it's f theta. Okay, so this forms the link. So as we see now, what is our task? If we want to produce a minimal surfaces from parametrized by Riemann surfaces, well, we have to create maps to this null quadric without zero such that this condition holds. Okay, and this, uh, as soon as I was told this, I, I said, well, this is something I know about because uh, I had been working the previous decade a lot on uh, something called Oka theory. And Oka theory is, uh, is a theory about, about the problem when you want to know, uh, let's say that you want to construct holomorphic maps from 
open Riemann surfaces or more complicated objects in higher dimension called Stein manifolds, Stein manifolds into some complex manifold. So you want to know when can you construct a lot of maps. For instance, the main question is uh, having a continuous map, when can you change it by homotopy to a holomorphic map? And, uh, and you see this question is rather classical and was studied first by Oka already in 39, then by Grauert in uh, 50, 57 and 58. And in fact, the main theorem which I need for this uh, minimal surface business is in fact one of Grauert's theorems. Um, well, before I get to that, let me finish the story. Anyway, um, let me finish the story. There is a, so here we were talking of maps to Rn, and we were looking at this condition that the real periods have to vanish. But you see, you can also look at holomorphic immersions to Cn, which, whose differential satisfy the same vanishing condition. And again, you conclude um, that every such is of this forum. Now it's, you integrate F theta without taking the real part, because now you really want a holomorphic object. And what now F should be? It should be a map which satisfied now the full period to be zero. Not only in the previous slide, you see we had a real period, real part. Now we have a full period that should be zero. So the conclusion is that if we call such curves holomorphic null curves, just because they are directed by this uh, null quadric, this means the tangent vector at each point is in the null quadric, okay? So that's why they're called null curves. And uh, now we see the connection immediately that the real and the imaginary part of a null curve are conformal minimal surfaces in Rn. And not only the real and the imaginary part, but you can rotate this, uh, you can multiply it with e to it, for instance, and take the real part. These are called associated surfaces. And, the co <coughs> and what is the converse? Well, if you have a conformal minimal surface, then it is locally, in fact, on every simply connected domain in M, the real part of a null curve. What is the problem in general is that, as you know, with harmonic function, you cannot take harmonic conjugate in general. You have conjugate periods. Okay, and likewise here, it's the same problem. You can take a harmonic map, which has, okay, so it will have, its differential has vanishing periods, but it has the conjugate differential has non-zero periods, maybe. And that's called a flux. These, these periods are called flux in this theory. Um, so here is a nice example. You have seen before the picture of a catenoid, and you have seen a picture of a helicoid. And it turns out that these two are closely related. They are actually called conjugate minimal surfaces because they are the real and the imaginary part of the same null curve. And here I wrote down the equation. This is not the only possible representation of it, but it's a simple one. Take cosine z, sine z minus i z. You multiply with e to i t, take the real part. You call it x t. So this is a minimal surface, and look what it is. It's a combination with cosine and sine of these two columns. Now the first column, you see here cosine hyperbolicus, and this is precisely the catenoidal curve, right? I mean y and cosine hyperbolic y, this is the catenoid. And this multiplying with, it with cosine and sine means that you rotate it in the space. So this is a catenoid. And this one is a parametrization of the helicoid. So it, when your time varies, uh, at, at time zero, you have this curve. At time pi over two or minus pi over two, you have this curve. And this is a helicoid. It's also easy to see because you have sine and cosine and x. So this means you're really rotating a line and lifting it at the same time. And <coughs> uh, now I wish to point out that, in fact, this connection, uh, how to use um, Weierstrass's formula, this has been really known since the early 60s when uh, this particular man, Robert Osserman, pioneered this approach in modern times. So in the, in the early 60s, he discovered this and he wrote a very beautiful book, which is even today one of the classics in the subject. Um, Osserman was actually more like a complex analyst. Uh, he was student of Alfors, and that's uh, very much prominent in his work. And he's a great expositor, so this book is really wonderful. 
Okay, now I come finally, I, I wish to say that even though uh, this was known in the 60s that complex analysis could be used, but for some reason, it wasn't used very much. So when I, when I first learned this thing, this was back in 2012 maybe, when I learned this thing from uh, these two people in Spain, uh, it was to me incredible how come that, you know, uh, these, these things after all were not so hard to do, how come that nobody has done them? I, I was really amazed. And also some people from Russia told me that, in fact, in Moscow they also knew this work of Osserman and they knew that he proposed this approach, complex analytic, but somehow it wasn't really developed. So here is some, um, but let me tell you, uh, let me ask you, when do I stop? So I don't want to, one hour? I don't want to be too long. Okay, so here are some topics I'd like to discuss, um, which, we, which we found in, we have probably now about 10 papers by now together with these people, and one, two of them also with my colleague, uh, Barbara Drinovets, who is from Ljubljana. Um, so one topic is the runge mergelian approximation theorems for conformal minimal immersions. So what this means, I'm sure you know, because Runge and Mergelian, these are classical approximation theorems for holomorphic functions. But it turns out that the exact, essentially the exact analogs uh, you can prove for minimal surfaces. Next thing, uh, we constructed proper conformal minimal immersions. So I now abbreviate this as CMI into Rn and minimally and in some class of domains which we call minimally convex. And again, this mimics something in complex analysis which is, which is called Levy pseudo-convex domains. So it's a kind of an analog to Levy pseudo-convexity, this minimal. It has the same role for, uh, so this notion plays the same role for minimal surfaces as the Levy pseudo-convexity does for complex curves. Another topic is a very famous one. It's called Calabi-Yau problem, but this is not Calabi-Yau manifolds, but it's a, it's a Calabi-Yau problem for minimal surfaces. I'll talk about it when I come to it. And then we have some new results on the Gauss map. And we have other things, but I couldn't put everything in one talk. So let's start with um, Runge's theorem. Here I'm just recalling what is a classical uh, Runge theorem. Uh, what is the classical approximation theorem in, uh, for, for holomorphic functions? So we call a set holomorphically convex if uh, in a Riemann surface, if the complement has no relatively compact connected components, no holes, as we say. Um, if M is equal to C, then of course this is connected in such case, and uh, K is called polynomially convex. So the complement has to be connected. And the classical theorem due to Runge is for functions in uh, C, so that every so that you can approximate holomorphic functions on compact polynomially convex sets by entire functions. And this was generalized to all open Riemann surfaces in this year, 49, by Benke and Stein. In fact, uh, in this paper, they proved the classical result that every open Riemann surface is what we now call a Stein manifold. So it has a lot of holomorphic functions, and in particular, you can approximate holomorphic functions on such, on such sets. And here is uh, then our theorem. Why I give two years? It's because Alarcon and Lopez, before we actually met, uh, they proved this uh, theorem in dimension three with some kind of ad hoc methods. And after we met, we discussed, and uh, then we found a much better proof which works in every dimension. So the theorem is you take a compact holomorphically convex set in, a Riemann, in an open Riemann surface, and you take a conformal minimal immersion, so a minimal surface defined on a neighborhood U, of K, we can approximate it on K by globally defined minimal immersions. Here I am outlining a proof. I said it will be a non-technical talk, but still I, I think some ideas are really easy to explain, so I'm outlining some few, some few things. Um, so, so we start with a conformal minimal immersion from some open, connected open set, U containing K. We can reduce to the connected case. So now recall this Weierstrass formula, which says that in fact, uh, X is given as an integral with some initial, it's, it's some initial value here at some point. It's the integral of the real part of F theta, where F uh, 
is a map, and this is a mistake. It should be u. It should be u. It's a, it's a holomorphic map from u into this punctured null quadric, and the real periods um, have to be zero. In fact, why I call it d? Because I have picked now a domain d. D is now a compact domain, smoothly bounded, which is between the set k and the open neighborhood u. It's just so I have a nicer, a nice domain. Then I have a, a basis of the homology group. Hom first homology group is then a finitely generated um, abelian group, so called it Z to the L. I take a curves which form a basis for this first homology group, and I define this uh, so called period map. Period map takes holomorphic functions on this domain, actually maps to Cn, to this space Cn to L, where L is the number of these curves. And what is the component? Each component of this period map is simply that I integrate f theta or the jth curve. Theta is some fixed one for them, fixed once and for all, like in the previous slide. And then I note that uh, one for them is exact if and only if this map is zero, because it just, just means these integrals are zero. And the real part is exact if and only if the real parts of the periods are zero. So I'm going to use this period map. Um, and here is the crucial lemma. Um, this is something non-technical. Um, given a non-flat holomorphic map from this domain into the null quadric, a non-flat just means that it's not contained in a ray. You see, th th this thing is a, really a quadric, right? So it's a union of rays, Pre lines, complex lines through zero. And, uh, and those maps, which actually are contained in a ray, a little bit a problem in this theory, but not really, because what they correspond to are, uh, if you integrate them, they correspond to surfaces which are flat, which actually lie in a Euclidean plane. So those are not so interesting. So we can avoid uh, those, really. So if I have a, such a non-flat map, um, then I can find an, uh, a neighborhood of the origin in this Euclidean space, and a holomorphic map from D across this neighborhood such that for time, and this is parameter now, I call it T. T is a member of this uh, V. So for parameter value zero, I get my original map. And if I look at this uh, family of periods, so I vary T, I look at the period map, and I take the derivative on T at time zero. So I take first variation, if you like, of this, uh, of this uh, period map on this family. It's a map from here to there, and this is an isomorphism. So the thing is that such a thing exists. So in, order, in other words, I'm saying, give me any map. I can vary, as long as this map is not flat, then I can vary it through a holomorphic family of maps of appropriate dimension, such that my periods vary in all possible directions. So periods become period map. The derivative of it is an isomorphism. And this is not hard to do because how I do such a thing, I use vector fields, flows of vector fields to vary in different directions. So it's a, um, sorry, I went too fast. Okay, so this lemma is not hard to prove, but now um, let's go on. Let's, we can also observe that the null quadric has convex hull, just geometrically convex hull, equal to all of Cn. That's actually a general effect about any algebraic subvariety. Algebraic subvariety of Cn, its convex hull is actually a linear subspace. It's not true for entire subvarieties, but it's true for algebraic. Um, and then, uh, since this is true, one can show easily that if you integrate g times theta, theta is this one forum, over all possible loops, C is a circle. So you integrate. Uh, over loops in the null quadric, and you look at what are all possible values of these integrals, and actually they are all of Cn. And this is a simple idea, which is the basic idea of Gromov's convex integration theory. You just, what you do, you say, um, I have a point in Cn. I can write it as a convex combination of points in my null quadric. And now what I do, okay, so I have some weights, right? It's a convex combination, some Pj times qj, say, times the points. Then I construct a curve which spends, which goes quickly to the first point, spends roughly the correct amount of time there, 
goes to the next point, to the next point, and so on. So that gives me roughly the right integral, and then uh, there is a trick to correct. So anyway, uh, it's not hard to prove this. So by considering such deformations for all loops in the period basis, um, we can create a smooth period dominating spray. So a map like in the previous slide, except that so initially it's only defined over the union of these curves. CJ is missing here. So this is the union of CJs, which has this map as a core. But there is another standard fact that these loops, CJ, these curves, can be taken such that the union of them is holomorphically convex. So once I created some functions on them, I can use Bergelian's theorem to approximate them by functions which are holomorphic on D. And that gives me the spray as in this lemma. So in other words, I get the spray simply by constructing a good thing on the curves themselves, and then I approximate. OK, how do I use the spray? Well, now comes Grauert. I already mentioned him. OK, this null quadric has another important structure, namely it's a homogeneous space of this particular group, Lie group. It's called a complex orthogonal group. So these are complex matrices which satisfy this relation without the conjugate, you see? Just AAT equal to I, so identity. So this is a complex Lie group, and, and this group acts transitively on the null quadric, except at zero, of course. So the punctured null quadric is homogeneous space. And here, Grauert's theorem says that any time you have a Stein manifold, Stein manifolds are like open Riemann surfaces or actually any manifold which is embeddable into Euclidean space, uh, maps from Stein manifolds to such a homogeneous manifold satisfy all sorts of properties. For example, the Runge approximation theorem in the absence of topological obstruction. So as long as there is no obstruction to approximate map on a subset by map on the whole, Manifold, you can do it. Um, so what I can do now is apply this theorem to approximate my map, which is this period map, which is defined on this domain in M cross V. V is a subset of Euclidean space to the null quadric by a globally defined map. Okay? And uh, since derivative of X was, in fact, the real part of my original forum, we have that the real part of the period of F is zero. This is uh, from the initial condition. If F is close enough to um, this, uh, if this approximation map is close to VF, then of course, uh, you see, per when I approximate, all periods will change. But since the initial period was zero, and my family of maps was period dominating, meaning that in the family I had all nearby periods, so once I approximate, I can find a nearby parameter value, t, such that this map, f of dot t, which I now call f tilde, still satisfies the same equation, that the real periods are zero. And this is crucial because now I can integrate it. And after I integrate it, I get a map, except there is a hitch here. Namely, I can only do this on a bigger domain, d prime, which is such that it retracts onto d. Um, such that D is a retract of D prime. In other words, if I change my domain in such a way that there is no change of topology, then I can approximate map on the small domain by map on the big domain. Yes. If there is a change of topology, then there are new curves, and then I, have, I know nothing about periods on them, so I cannot integrate maybe. Okay, so that's uh, the moment not cl clear. But at least if there is no change of topology, I, can, I have this approximation theorem. So this x tilde already approximates x. And here I explain you a little bit how I uh, deal with a change of, uh, how I deal with a change of period, uh, with a change of topology. But maybe I better draw a picture because it's essentially just like this. You have a domain and you, to change of topology, you just try by something like this. Maybe this bigger domain. So it's described by attaching an arc to the previous domain. But that's one particular change, but this is the main one. That's when you go, when you take a Morse exhaustion function and you go through a critical point of index one. That's exactly what happens, that you have to attach an arc. So what do I do? Uh, well, I have my map already defined on this domain. Now I have to extend it smoothly across this arc. 
in such a way that it's integral of is correct because finally I'll have to integrate. So I have, I need to have the, the integral of my forum on this arc is actually equal to the difference of values of the already given map at the two endpoints in order that the integrals will come out right. And after that, I more or less repeat the story which I told you. So I put this thing into a spray, approximate by Mergelian. Here I have to use not Runge but Mergelian on this object. And finally, I find a map on a bigger domain which uh, satisfies the period condition also on this loop. You see there is a new loop here. This arc is a, perhaps a part of a new loop. And I satisfy the condition also on this loop. Okay, good. So now I'm in business. And then I just have to do induction. I'm not going to read the rest of the slide. Okay, and then um, after this theorem, we said, okay, how about uh, proper maps, right? That's more interesting because proper means that you put the thing so that the boundary goes to infinity. So the image is closed. You have a, a much better object if you look at proper maps. And in fact, we realized that with this technique, which I just explained you, plus the usual technique how you construct proper maps, we could, uh, in fact, prove this theorem. So there are three parts. I take any open Riemann surface. First part says that in, if you want to go to R3, there are a lot of proper conformal minimal immersions. In fact, proper immersions form a dense subset in the space of all conformal minimal immersions in the compact open topology. So you give me any any minimal immersion, any conformal minimal immersion from a good subset of M, I can approximate it by a globally defined one, which in addition is proper. So the boundary goes to infinity. Okay. Um, I'm talking of immersions here, and I will show you later a result that in general, this is uh, not possible with embeddings. In fact, uh, I'll, on a later slide, there will be a theorem about embeddings, but this is just immersions. Now, what if you go to R4 instead? In R4, the natural thing you can expect, and uh, we also proved it, is that there are such things which are only simple double points, meaning transverse double points, okay? And if you go to five or higher, then we can create embeddings, always. So here is a comment uh, which, I want, which I mentioned before. In fact, uh, there has been a lot of works, but maybe the crowning work is this one, Mix, Perez, and Ross from a few years ago. They show that, in fact, planes, flat planes, catenoids, helicoids, and Riemann's examples, which you also saw in one of the slides, are the only properly embedded minimal planar domains in R3. So as far as embedded, you are much more restricted. Uh, of course, now, these same people, I believe, are working on further results because one would like to know how about if it's not a planar domain? How about if it has some genus? It's a domain in some more complicated Riemann surface. Well, uh, I think they have some results already, but its story is not complete. Uh, and there is a corresponding, uh, the, uh, there is a problem which we post and we don't know. How about you go into R4? Question, does every open Riemann surface embed into R4 properly as a conformal minimal surface? We don't know. And there is a um, connection with complex curves because, in fact, complex curves are also minimal surfaces, special cases of minimal surfaces. So there is a corresponding open problem quite well known since long time ago called Bell, Forster, and Simkin conjecture. They actually conjecture that the answer is yes, but I'm not sure that it's true, so I rather call it conjecture. Does every open Riemann surface admit embedding into C2? That's also open. Of course, if you could uh, solve this one, yes, then this would be also yes. Or if this is no, then this is no, because there are more uh, minimal surfaces than complex curves. In this, co in this context, I wish to mention that Erland Wald from Oslo and myself have uh, two papers in recent period, one of them is 2013, one is a bit older, which gives, uh, uh, in fact, the two best known results still at the moment about which Riemann surfaces will embed into C2. 
For example, we proved that every circle domain possibly infinitely connected in C, this means you take from C countably many disks in such a way that you get an open domain, such a thing is embeddable. Um, but the question is, far op is wide open. Uh, and while doing this thing, uh, this I mentioned just as a curiosity, there is a famous example of a mix from some, I don't know, 15 years ago maybe, uh, of an immersed minimal Möbius strip immersed into R3, which has finite total curvature. In fact, the minimal possible finite Gaussian curvature. Uh, okay, we found an example uh, where it's an embedded minimal strip in R4. It seems to be the first known example. Very simple map, actually. You just have to do some checking. The main problem was not to check that this map is good. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just how to, to come up with the formulas. I, I'm talking about minimal strip. So here I take Riemann surface to be C star. Uh, and this is map from C star. But in fact, it's, uh, you see, it has this property that uh, two points are identified under this map if and only if the point is either Z1 and Z2 or Z1 is minus 1 over Z2 bar. And this map, Z sending to minus 1 over Z bar, is the reflection around the circle. So it's this reflection around the circle. Uh, so what happens when you, uh, um, in fact, um, no, in fact, it's not this reflection. This would be, it's the, it's the, it has to be the opposite. So it's this one here. So in fact, if you look on the circle itself, the antipodal points get identified. So that's why you get a Möbius strip. Now, I, want, I promised something about minimally convex domains. So what is this minimal convexity? Um, I was asking myself, you see, since I have a background in complex analysis, it's natural to ask, what is a good class of real functions on which your objects, in complex analysis, maybe complex curves or complex submanifolds, on which you have maximum principle? So the good class of functions for complex analysis are the subharmonic or the plurisubharmonic functions, right? Subharmonic functions are precisely those whose restriction on curves will be uh, actually plurisubharmonic are those whose restriction on complex curves will be subharmonic. And so we identified such a class of functions on the real domain. I call a smooth function minimal plurisubharmonic uh, if the following is true. You take all the eigenvalues of the Hessian of rho. So this is a real function. You take its Hessian. You take the eigenvalues, order them, and you take the first two, the smallest two, and you ask that this be bigger or equal to zero. So it means only one eigenvalue can be negative, all the rest non-negative. Um, and then uh, the, basically the main thing is that we showed that rho is minimal plurisubharmonic if and only if the composition with every conformal minimal surface is a subharmonic function on that minimal surface. After we came up with this class, we have realized that in fact we were not the first ones. We found some papers by Harvey and Lawson where they also treated this class of functions and they did some general things. But we at least had a good theorem after that. I mean, we had a, we had a theorem where this was used. So what is the theorem? Um, I'm stating only a special case for R3, just to be simpler. So if I have a domain in R3, which is minimally pseudo-convex in the sense that it admits a minimal plurisubharmonic exhaustion function, so one satisfying this condition, then every, then, if I have a compact bordered Riemann surface, so this means Riemann surface with boundary, right? Riemann surface with finitely many boundary components, then every conformal minimal immersion of the surface into the domain can be approximated on compacts by proper conformal minimal immersions from the interior. So really this means I can, if M is entirely together with boundary lying inside, I can now stretch the boundary 
to the boundary of the domain. That's what I'm saying. I can create proper ones. And in fact, simple examples show that this is the best class of domains in which I can do it. And this theorem is actually, I think of it as an analog of the theorem in complex analysis, which says that if you take a Hartox or Levy zero convex domain, then any compact Riemann surface which you put inside as a complex curve, you can stretch the curve, you can stretch the boundary out to the boundary. So you can make it proper. It's a, but, um, Okay, so in, it's similar, but in fact, to prove it was uh, much harder. And there is another idea. I don't have too much time left. So instead of reading through the slide, I'd like to draw another picture. Uh, uh, we introduced a method which is uh, coming from complex analysis called Riemann-Hilbert boundary value problem. It's a classic, one of the classical um, subjects of complex analysis since 100 years ago. But uh, we found a way of using it in this theory. So what we do with this thing? So we do the following. Uh, let M be a, such a compact Riemann surface with boundaries. So it means one of these things. So M is uh, something like that. It has a few finitely many boundary components. Now you map it in some space. How do I call this map? Maybe I call it um, uh, X, I think. Here I'm in, um, well, here I'm in R3. But I could be in Rn, actually. We have versions of this thing for Rn. So if, I, if you think of this picture, let, let, let's say that this is my X of M. So it's sitting in as a curve with boundary in R3. Yes, now what I do um, is I also have this map, which I call F in the slide. And what does this map do? This map says, take a boundary point of this first curve and put a conformal minimal disk. Attach to it a conformal minimal disk. So this is a disk with center point is here. So this is my F disk now f of p xi, and xi is the variable on the unit disk. And I attach these disks around. So basically, here I have also one. I have one at each boundary point. In fact, I do it on an arc. And then I say that, in fact, what I can do with this figure now, I can approximate the central curve by a new curve, image of m, which does something like this. It's very close to M most of the place. And then when you come to the boundary, it will go almost to the boundary here. So this yellow, this yellow thing now is a X tilde of M. So this is a new conformal minimal um, surface such that X tilde approximates X on as big compact subset as you like of this M contained inside. But at the boundary, you go almost to the torus. OK, so this in complex analysis has been well known for a long time, and it's not very hard to do. It's hard to solve the problem exactly, but not approximately. But it was much harder to adapt it to this minimal surface case. But if you do such a thing, then you see, um, now you have technique for doing many things. Because you see, the way you attach these disks, this means that you are changing the boundary values from these to those. So for instance, if you manage to pick your disks in such a way that this exhaustion function is bigger on the boundary than on the center, then when you do this game, you have actually pushed the boundary of the surface to higher level of your exhaustion function. So doing this inductively, you push it all the way to the boundary. That's one strategy. But this thing, so I will skip all the rest of this explanation. Uh, but this strategy was also used, and this I'll finish with then with this subject. I just want to go through this slide, and then I finish. This, uh, this technique turned out to be extremely useful uh, in the subject, which is called Calabi-Yau problem. Uh, what was Calabi-Yau problem? So um, I actually, let me first read the theorem. 
Okay, we take a compact border treatment surface, so one of these. We take a conformal minimal immersion of the closed surface inside Rn, and then we say that it can be approximated uniformly on M by continuous maps to Rn, such that in the interior, in M interior, this is a conformal minimal immersion, and in addition, it's complete. What does this complete now mean? This means that it's a complete metric space in the induced metric from the Euclidean metric. Okay, what does this intuitively mean, that it's a complete metric space? This means that this Riemann surface which I created, I mean this minimal surface which I created, it stays as close as I like to the original one, but it is very, very wiggly at the boundary. It has lots of waves. It's so wiggly that if you take any curve inside the surface, which goes out to the boundary point, and you measure the length of this curve in the Euclidean metric, it's infinite, okay? So these surfaces are staying in a bounded set, but they are complete, metrically complete. And this has been, so this, this question was first asked by Calabi in 65. So he asked, actually he conjectured that this cannot be done. His conjecture was that if you have a minimal surface in a bounded subset of Euclidean space, that it cannot be complete. Or other words, if it is complete, it has to be proper. It has to go to infinity, then it's clearly complete. Okay, so this was Calabi's conjecture. Calabi's conjecture was disproved in a very crucial way in 96 by uh, Nadir Ashvili. In fact, he found a complete bounded minimal disk in R3. Uh, there was a later work there were many works in this area. Why is, Calab why is uh, Yao mentioned? Because Yao wrote a big survey paper on problems in geometry, the so-called Millennium paper in 2000, and this was one of the things he discussed, and he outlined the remaining problems. Um, there was a paper by Martin Anadirashvili, who claimed to have constructed complete minimal disk with Jordan boundary, but the proof is uh, not complete the way it's written. Actually, it, we think it cannot be completed. So we introduced a new method by which this can be done. You see, because what we have, not only is the interior complete, but the boundary is Jordan boundary. And you have to work very hard to, to have this Jordan boundary. It, ca it cannot be better than Jordan, because you see, by the isoperimetric inequality, the boundary will be infinitely long everywhere. It's a it's completely non-rectifiable curve. Otherwise, the interior couldn't be complete. Yes. Um, I also want to mention that, in fact, um, Calabi was partially right, because Calabi, it seems that he uh, kind of had in mind embedded surfaces. And in fact, it was proved by Kolding and Minikozzi in a series of papers that the Calabi, you know, that actually it's, it's true for embedded surfaces. Not, they haven't proved it in complete generality, but for instance, for the, uh, surfaces of finite topological type, meaning finite genus, finite number of ends, they prove that if it's embedded as a minimal surface, and if it's complete, it has to go to infinity. It has to be proper. They actually have kind of reverse estimate, which says that you cannot increase the length very much in a limited space. Well, what we do exactly is to show that if you immerse or if you go to higher dimension, then you can wiggle as much as you like in a very limited space, as little as, as possible. Fine, and then I have uh, something about Gauss map, but I'm over my time. I just, uh, one nice result is that if you know what Gauss map is, it's just the usual Gauss map of a surface, right? But it uh, turns out that for minimal surfaces, Gauss map is in fact a conformal map. It's in fact a meromorphic function on your Riemann surface. You can think of it like that. And what we proved is that actually every meromorphic function can be the Gauss map of some somebody. So for each meromorphic function you take, there is a conformal minimal surface which has exactly this Gauss map. And uh, this I was also surprised that after so many years of the theory that uh, such a basic thing wasn't no, but anyway, this was done with these te new, new techniques. And uh, okay, I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>